Good morning, I'm Father Ryan Humphreys and you're here with for the Catholic Underground COVID Catechism. We are now in part four of our four part series on the book of Revelation. And I for one am very excited to kind of come to this last part because if you remember we've covered quite a lot of ground and not all of it has been directly associated with the book of Revelation. Uh, the first thing we talked about was the, how do we study the Bible, generally speaking? What's the point? What do we know about the Bible? And how can we speak intelligibly about it? Then we moved on to the first two chapters, first uh, chapters two and three, the first meaningful chapters of the book of Revelation, where we dug straight into the message of the angels to these various churches. Remember, we talked about Philadelphia and Pergamum and so on. And the angels had messages for the different churches. And remember, those messages were, generally speaking, God does not like imposters. He does not like idolaters. He wants us to keep ourselves pure in terms of the religion we practice and the morality that we keep. Uh, we know that the Lord wants to save us and raise us up to positions of honor in heaven. Uh, we know that he is serious about his love for us, regardless of the difficulties that we experience in life, and he wants to be here with us. You know, the core messages of the angels speaking to the churches. Then we talked about heaven, hell, and judgment in part three, and we talked also about the end of the world. Now, it's possible to be a little disappointed by talk three because most of what I talked about was heaven. What do we know about heaven? What are the three or four different images of heaven that we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, chapter 12, chapters 19 through 22? Uh, and we also started to dig in a little bit about hell, where heaven is the fullness of divine presence and hell is the absence of it. And then, of course, it's possible to be a little disappointed because when we get to the end times, it turns out that an awful lot of the images that we see, it's really not necessary to know much about them. I mean, it might be fascinating to say, I'd like to understand what the deal is with the blonde hair and the hornets that happen to have the, have the stingers of scorpions. But end of the day, those really aren't helpful in growing in our faith, and they're not helpful in coming to understand how we are to get to heaven. And so I hold off on, on going through the details of those, but if you're one of the people who really wants to know, there are some wonderful books, and the best book is by Dr. Scott Hahn on the subject, the book of, of, of Revelation, and the, he has several books, but that one is one that's really worth digging into. And so I certainly encourage you, if you're interested in all the minutia and all the little details, he goes into all that, and he even gets into the idea of those rapture theologians who want to kind of find a one-to-one -one connection and who believe that black government helicopters are actually what we're talking about when we get to the idea of those hornets for various reasons. And he'll explain why that way of thinking, as well as the specificity of those different arguments, doesn't work. The thing is, it gets a little in the weeds, and it would be five or six or eight parts to get through the book of Revelation if we did things that way. So we did the Bible, we did the messages of the angels, we did the heaven, hell, and the end of the world, and now we come to the last part, the part of the book of Revelation that I'll admit is one of my favorite, and I believe is absolutely the most important for all of us, for priests and for laity alike to dig into, and that is the images of worship in the book of Revelation. Now, the official worship of the church, the Catholic Church, is called the sacred liturgy. Now the word liturgy, liturgia, comes from the Greek word for to work or a deed or an endeavor. The mass is a liturgy. The baptismal, the celebration, the ceremony around baptism is a liturgy. Uh, the, the benediction of the most blessed sacrament is a liturgy. These are, are things that basically it's the church in formal prayer. Okay, so this is, this is prayer that is made tangible, and it includes the whole gamut of things that are associated with that formal prayer, from the words, to the gestures, to the vesture, to the items that are used, to the architecture of the space, to the furnishings, to the music that is associated with it, to the role of the worshipers, and all of it combined. That is all together the sacred liturgy. It's the formal prayer of the church. And so I want to ask you a question that you may have been asked if you have a lot like I do of, of Protestant friends in the workplace, or you may not have even thought of at all. Why is it 
that Catholics do not spend as much time reading the Bible as many other Christians? Why is it that Catholics do not focus their attention and do not embrace the study of the Bible to the degree that many others, especially Protestant Christians, believe that a, a person who is a follower of Jesus should. Why is that? Now, first of all, don't tell me that it's because, oh, well, you know, Catholics, uh, Catholics aren't just, just don't like to study. And don't tell me it's because of nuns and monks and whatever. And it's not because that, you know, we were simply told not to do it. We do study the Bible less than other faiths. We do, and we should. The reason for that being very, very simply that we as Catholics are called to live the scriptures. We come to mass and those scriptures come to life. They are manifest. And we are not called by the Lord God, by the Father in heaven, by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, by the Blessed Virgin Mary, by St. Hildegard or Bingen. We are not called by any dictate of the Bible itself, of revelation or anything else, to study in gross detail every aspect of this one part of the revelation that the Lord has given us. Because the Bible is an essential part of God's revelation of himself to us. But the Bible is not the totality or the fulfillment or the fullness of what the Lord has revealed about himself to us. And y'all, that's a big difference. We don't believe, as many of our Protestant brothers and sisters do, that the Bible is the definitive revelation of God. It's not. Jesus Christ is the definitive revelation of God. And when it comes to how God has revealed himself, the Bible is a big, gigantic, important part. So is the tradition that we have discovered of how to interpret and understand both the Bible as well as the larger world around us and our own human nature through the course of history. That's tradition with a capital T. And then we have the magisterial teaching of the church, and we have these three sources of revelation. But even more than that, we have the living out of the Christian faith. We have the sacred liturgy, which manifests the reality of Jesus Christ in a way that supersedes and surpasses any study of the Bible. And so the next time someone looks at you and says, well, Catholics don't study the Bible enough, they don't read their Bibles enough, we can actually look back and say, because we have Mass, we have the sacraments, I receive Jesus Christ. I don't need to read about him. I need to know him. And while it is important, and while it is beneficial for me to read the Bible, for you to read the Bible, for us to study the Bible in the way that we're doing now, it is absolutely secondary to the worship of God, which is the true purpose for which we exist. And so it's far, far more important for us to encounter God at the sacred liturgy in the midst of the church at prayer than it is merely to read about or to study or even to go privately to the Lord in my own way. And this is something I want to dig into, especially as we dig into this, because this is what the book of Revelation is really trying to show us. Far more than the end of the world, far more than any of the details associated with, with something that, you know, historical detail about Pergamum or Philadelphia, it's about the church at prayer. And so we, we have to say, or rather I should say, so, so we say the scriptures are an incredibly valuable part of our faith. The tradition is an incredibly valuable part of our faith. The magisterium is an incredibly part of, valuable part of faith. But then we have the sacred liturgy, which is what we're really here to do. Also, it's worth noting, just as a side note, there will be no Bible in heaven. The Bible exists as God revealing to our limited human understanding his infinite majesty in a limited way in, the, in terms of paper and syllables and words and ideas. So there will be no Bible in heaven. There will be no tradition in heaven because there won't be anything new to learn or to garner or to grasp. And there will be no magisterium in heaven. There will, need, need, be, need, no, there will need be, there will not need to be any kind of formal teaching because we will see the Lord face to face. But what will exist in heaven is 
is the sacred liturgy, the worship of God. And in fact, the book of Revelation makes clear that what heaven is, in many ways, is an eternal act of worship of God. And so this is, is one of the reasons that we really need to pay attention to and come to understand why we do what we do at Mass, what we do when it comes to the church at prayer. You know, one of the things I find utterly fascinating, especially as we, we kind of have, have go back and forth in the Catholic Church for the last 65 years about what the Mass should look like, the two great camps are the Mass should be oriented toward the Lord and the Mass should be created in such a way as to make me feel like I can connect to it. And those are two really different attitudes. One is very much oriented toward the Lord, and the other is very much oriented toward me. And while there is a sense of I prefer within Christianity, what we see in the book of Revelation, and what I really want to kind of bring to, to, to the surface here, is that the Mass is not about what we want. The Mass is not about singable hymns. The Mass is not about making me feel included. It's not about drawing me in. Worship really is 150% about God and God alone. And so it becomes kind of this moment where I, I as the worshiper, am not really part of, of the liturgy in the sense that the liturgy should be directly oriented toward me. And, and I want to kind of walk through this in a couple of ways. Let's turn to the first, first part of this by thinking just for a moment about the Jews. And then I want us to get our Bibles ready because we're going to be flipping uh, to Revelation chapter 5. But let's take a quick look at the Jews. Jewish worship is what we might call sacrificial replacement worship worship sacrificial replacement worship the jews offered thanksgiving offerings they offer uh, peace offerings they offer uh, uh, pleading offerings they offer sin offerings and these offerings thanksgiving offerings obviously giving thanks to god sin offerings uh, offered in in expiation of the justice that we deserve for sins that we have committed against god um, this notion of replacement of course, constantly has to be renewed. It constantly has to continue because the thanksgiving, the pleading, the sinning continue to happen. And so within Jewish worship, you had this very formalized structure. And remember what happened. You would, if you were the father of the family that needed to offer the, the thanksgiving offering or the sin offering, you would take your animal whether it was Joseph taking the two small turtle doves when Jesus was circumcised, whether it was the father of the family at Passover bringing along the lamb, and you would go into uh, the, the temple, which was a set of concentric squares. So you had a big, wide building uh, that was the outer court, and that was where the Gentiles could be. And then you had a slightly inner court, which was a smaller concentric building. So if you have a big building, you have a smaller building inside. And when you go in there, then that's the court of the women. And then you go in a little further, and it's the court of men. And then you go in a little further, and you have these smaller and smaller and smaller courtyards. And when you finally get to the altar area, the court of the priests, or the court of the Levites, then you would take your animal, and you would hand that animal off to the priest or to his assistant. And depending on how busy a day, there might be a hundred priests, or there might be five priests. And there is a big, giant altar just a big hunk of stone, big old giant stone thing that may have had some carvings, it may not, we're not 100% sure, and there was a fire at one part of it, and so basically the, the priest would come in and you would, you, know, you would offer your thank offering to God because behind the priests was the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, that's where the Ten Commandments were kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. That was where nobody was allowed to go, and that was the most concentric part of the temple. And then outside of that, you had the court of the priests, and you have these other courts that just spread out in a larger concentric way. And so you would bring this thank offering or this sin offering, and the priest would receive it on behalf of the Lord, and he would bring it to the altar, and he would cut, kill the animal. He might cut the head off the bird, he might slit the throat of the goat, whatever. And then he would take a sprig of hyssop plant, which is just a bush kind of plant with a lot of little tiny leaves, and he would rub that plant in the wound of this animal, getting all the blood that he could on it, and then he would sprinkle the blood onto the altar, and that was the consummation of this replacement offering. Sounds a little gross, 
just have to put yourself in a different mind and a different culture. But that's what an offering in the Jewish culture looked like. It was very, very ritualized. God received your offer and went and did his own thing. So with that in mind, let's think now a little bit about how the book of Revelation talks about some of these stuff. So let's go ahead and jump to chapter 4 in the book of Revelation. I'm going to skip around a bit through the first, say, eight verses or so. At, at, as we're going to start with chapter 4, verse 2, and we're going to just kind of hop around a little bit. So, at once I was in the Spirit, and lo, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. Round the throne were 24 elders, or 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clad in white garments, with golden crowns upon their heads. Before the throne burned seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, they never cease to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's think about a few things here. First of all, let's do just a little piece of trivia about the end. The book of Revelation is written in Greek, but the idea here when we hear these, these people at the end who are singing these hymns, they're using a language that we would assume and we believe through study is actually the language of the Hebrew temple, which is a little bit different than the vulgar Hebrew you would speak on the street, and which was certainly different than the Aramaic that was spoken at home indicating that there was a ritual language that was distinct and different from regular language. You know, several years ago when we changed the missile and we stopped saying, and also with you, and we started saying, and with your spirit, people were like, well, this isn't the way people talk. And, you know, at the time, a lot of priests were having to explain ritual language is not meant to be the way people talk. If you talk at church the way you talk at the barbecue, then there is a confusion. There's a level of difficulty as far as that goes. But let's, let's you know, go forward. That's a little trivia at the end that's worth knowing about. So we have here a few things that are worth looking at that are associated with the way that the Jews did things. There's a throne which is where the Holy of Holies should be in the temple. Notice we have this idea of we have the thing at the center and then around it and around it and around it. That's the Jewish temple, which is kind of the prototype for what we're looking at. Incidentally, most churches that have what we call a high altar or a rarados, uh, you can see here we don't have one, but most of them you'll notice have these little kind of, they look like cities. They look like they have windows in them. They have little spikes that look like, like architectural kind of details. And that high altar is meant to look like a city. In fact, it's meant to look like the new Jerusalem. And there's a reason that heaven is described in city-like language that is associated with Jerusalem and with the temple and with Mount Sion. Because for the Jewish mind, everything comes down to the Holy of Holies. And whatever is around the Holy of Holies, within the temple or within the larger city of Jerusalem, is meant to be kind of a prototype for understanding how heaven will work. And so what we have here is a picture that heaven is meant to be uh, teased just a little bit in the way that the Jewish people, which is where Jesus came from, in the way that the Jewish people conducted their own worship. We also see uh, the, the sense of a hierarchy where there is the alt, there's the throne at the center, which ostensibly is where God sits, and then you have kind of right next to that in kind of a, 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 a sort of um, way you would understand an elliptical arrangement where there's two centers of gravity. You have the altar with the lamb. Of course, we know that, that this is a, an image. We know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one divine Godhead, three persons, not separable, but we're trying to paint an image here. But we have a hierarchical notion where the throne and the altar, and then around that we have four living creatures. Around that we have the angels who are done giving their messages to the various cities. Around that we have the elders, both of the twelve apostles and of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then we have this kind of sense of going out in levels of importance. So we have a very hierarchical sense where there's not a sense of we're all on the same level here. There is a sense that there's God and you're either closer to him or farther away from him. There are also seven lampstands which are meant to, to be an image of the lampstands or the menorah 
in the temple, which are a sign of the presence of God. And in fact, one of the great uh, tragedies and sadnesses of the ancient world is when the menorah itself was taken away uh, by, the Philip, by the Babylonian king, the idea was the presence of God abandoned his temple. The, the, the candles were not the presence, but they were the sign of the presence, which is why Catholics nowadays keep candles burning in front of the tabernacle. And in fact, there's a rule, although it's an extremely obscure rule that I came across in an extremely obscure book, that we're supposed to have an odd number of candles. We're not supposed to have two candles. We're supposed to have three or five or seven or nine, but not an even number. And it's just kind of a way of referencing the reality of, you know, th that this is the, what it was in the Jewish temple, which was a kind of sign of what was to come. We also have this notion of ritual chanting. We had this huge group of people who were all singing together, not whatever their own heart makes them want to sing, but they're singing together. And it's something that, it, that arises from their hearts, but it is not a random piece. It's not a spontaneous piece. There is a sense of a genuine kind of ritual. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, if we jump ahead of a chapter, adds that between the throne and everyone else, that there is the, the lamb on the altar. And we have the image of the lamb who is dead and also alive. So we don't want to, in our minds, think about a lamb that just has some blood, like he's just gotten finished filming an action movie with Michael Bay. We're talking about a lamb that clearly looks dead and yet is clearly alive. Uh, in, in a way that we might associate with something like a really good zombie prosthetic. But, but it's really hard to get our heads around because he's saying things that are meant to be not compatible. It's meant to be something that is not just a symbolic thing, but is a genuine sense of that the lamb is dead and the lamb is alive. If we jump ahead a little bit more to Revelation 8, chapter 2, we see that there are seven angels having delivered their message and they stand there around the altar and they offer up incense, ritual prayers of incense, which of course is a symbol of the sweetness of prayer rising up to heaven. But remember, there's nowhere for it to rise to. Incense doesn't rise above. Who's it going to go to? And so the incense itself has this sense of ritual going back to the Jewish worship of God by the use of incense rising up to heaven. The idea is it symbolizes the going up to the Lord, which is when the Lord is symbolically up above us. If we jump ahead a little more to Revelation chapter 14, we see that the Lamb is on Mount Zion, which is where Jerusalem is. And we see that at this point the 144,000 people now, why 144,000 people? Well, two numbers, 10 times 10 and 12 times 12. 12 is the symbol of the promise. 12 is the symbol of the number of tribes of Israel, the number of the apostles. It is the symbol of this is how God fulfills his promise. God is good. God is faithful to himself. And so the number 12 uh, is a deeply, deeply associated in the Jewish mind with that notion of fulfilling of promises. Now, we should add, um, when the Jews would uh, want to really hammer something home, they would imply a square of a number. So like, you know, okay, if, if, if God is faithful in 12 apostles, then multiplying 12 times 12 is the completeness or the fullness of God's faithfulness. That doesn't make sense to us. It is what it is. When Jesus says, must I forgive seven times, when Jesus, when Jesus is asked, must I forgive seven times, that's why he says no, not seven times, but seven times seven times. This God-awful translation of 77 times, don't, don't buy it, it's just bad Greek. But seven times seven times, which means we have to forgive the fullness of forgiveness. And of course, seven has its own symbolic meaning in the Hebrew culture because of the seven uh, seven arms of the lampstand has to do with God being faithful to himself as well, although in a different sense, in a different context. Now we have 12 times 12, but to get to 144,000, we also need 10 times 10. And 10 times 10 is where the Hebrew culture has this notion of 
absolute and total perfection. 10 is just the image of perfection. Why? I don't know why. It simply is. And so 12 times 12, 10 times 10, and when you multiply those together, you get the idea of the fullness, completeness, totality of the complete and utter and total perfection of God's goodness and his promise to his people, 144,000 people. Now that, again, doesn't need to make sense to us, but this is something that in the Jewish mind was extremely potent. And in fact, if you go back when you read the scriptures now and you look at some of these numbers, you'll see numbers like 40 that show up an awful lot. Numbers like 7 and 12 and 10 show up over and over and over again. We're also going to have a certain sense where that 666 as the image of the Antichrist becomes associated with the idea that 6 is not 7. It is not perfect. And when we have the, the divine number, the number 3, which symbolizes the, the holy name, we, uh, we end up with this idea of an unholy or imperfect notion of God, kind of an anti-perfection of God, 666. And so the Jews had, had a, a very deep sense of this, and in a large part, the reason for that is, as a nomadic culture, there was just a lot of ordinary, normal things. I'm trading you 10 sheep, or I'm trading you, you know, a thousand of uh, uh, measures of grain and so you have this this sense where we're not worried about finding out how to do anti-differentials under the curve you know we're not worried about taking the integral uh, you know using the washer method these are people who are worried about practical things and so when we get to something like symbolic numbers the divine God has to be understood in the Jewish mind in, some, in a way that is extremely practical. And that means having these, these kind of small numbers combined to make big numbers that most of them didn't have any way of visualizing. I mean, you and I could never visualize a million of anything. Even a million sheets of copy paper is, you know, I mean, it, it, we just can't get our brains around what that would be like, how much that is. For the, for the Jewish people, 144,000 is an unthinkably large number, which is itself a product of the perfection of God's goodness and the perfection of God's faithfulness. If we jump ahead even a little further, Revelation 14, chapter 6, we see the notion of the proclamation of the gospel, even in eternity. Revelation 19, 8, then we start getting the idea about the victors being clothed in ceremonial garb. Um, and, of course, we see that in the, in the Gospels as well, where Jesus talks about you need to have your wedding garment. You need to have your special, uh, formal garment that is, that is specifically associated with the Jewish ceremonial tradition. In Revelation 19.10, we see the angel saying that worship, specifically bowing down and offering the same kind of worship that the elders do, is something which is good for us. It's something that's necessary for us. It is something that we must do in order to be faithful to what God wants from us. Now, there are some subtleties that we could go into. Uh, remember that the plagues and scourges are given to show the power that God has over them. Um, and, and you can remember, too, uh, some other things in there about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and we could certainly get into some more of that. Again, I'm going to point you to Dr. Scott Hahn's book for all of those nuances and subtleties. But right now, I want to look at the fascinating passages, and specifically the fascinating resemblance in our passages to the Jewish liturgy. And I want us in the back of our minds to think about Sunday Mass. So, one, there is a sense of hierarchy in terms of space in the book of Revelation. The altar is in the sanctuary. The pulpit is in the sanctuary. The high altar is made to look like the New Jerusalem. Uh, the New Jerusalem which reaches up to heaven and points up to heaven, hence the high altar. And the idea that really in, uh, the architecture should draw us up and not toward one another. These churches that are built in the round really draws our attention to one another. When in reality, we should be drawn up by the architecture because that's what the architecture is meant to be. Um, 
the, the, the book of Revelation, we have this idea that, that the sanctuary is distinct from the rest of the world. And so in a church where, where it's designed properly, we should see an altar, we should see the pulpit, we should see the throne, um, which should not necessarily be solid gold, but the throne is not for the priest to prop himself up on. The throne is meant to be an image of the place that the, God, the Lord God himself sits. The altar rail then reminds us of that division. The altar rail reminds us that, um, that uh, goodness, I just lost my place for a second. The altar rail reminds us that we are not yet in the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, and so if your church does not have an altar rail, you might notice that it's, it may seem natural at this point, but, but the sanctuary doesn't feel away. And there was this whole movement, you know, 50 years ago of saying, oh, we, we want people to feel close. But the reality is we're not in heaven yet. And when we, when we kind of artificially remove that, the veil, which is meant to represent the, 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 the separation between life and death, when we remove that veil, we end up kind of misconstruing what's going on because the mass is not itself already heaven. The mass is what, we, what I should say, the, the rit liturgies, the rituals that take place in the sanctuary are not, are meant to be something, goodness, I got confused. Let me say, let's, let's just start again. So the, the sanctuary separates where everybody else sits from where the liturgy action happens. The sanctuary is meant to represent heaven, and the rituals that take place there are meant to imitate exactly what we see in the book of Revelation right here in all these different chapters, 4, 5, 8, uh, 14, uh, 19, where we start to see these kinds of different things play out. Um, I got a little flustered for a minute because there was a major typo on my, uh, my notes below, and I got my, my brain went off in different directions. Um, Let's also look at the way that our Mass uh, has this sense of ritual back and forth. In the book of Revelation, we see over and over again the idea that there is a call back and forth, where the, the, the elders lay down their crowns, and in this ritual action, in the worship that they offer, where they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, then there is a call and response from the 144,000 who are back a little bit, and they then respond and they sing their particular part. We have the same sort of thing very deliberately happening at Mass, where we have the, 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 the priest will represent the 24 elders and say, the Lord be with you, and then we will respond in a way that is very, very deliberately ritual. It's not, hi, it's not, hey, Father, it's, and with your spirit, which is not the way we would talk at a barbecue, but it is the way that we, we talk when it comes to, uh, to what we're doing at Mass. It's also worth taking a moment to realize things, uh, the, the image of something like incense, the image of something like lampstands, which have exactly the same symbolism in the Jewish culture as they have in our culture now. Um, really, when it comes to the way that we think about worship, uh, when it comes to the way that we think about the liturgy, generally speaking, there was an interesting thing that took place in the Jewish world um, way back when, and, and I, I, I don't know my history well enough to give you an exact year, but it's going to be something that began in about the 6th century BC, and that's going to be a split in the Jewish world between synagogue worship and temple worship. And so you had the folks who lived in Jerusalem who became very, very much temple-centric. And then you had the people who lived kind of more in the rural areas, and it was inconvenient to get to the temple. They became synagogue-centric. And the synagogue was the place where the word, goodness, where the word was spoken. And the temple was the place where the worship was offered. And the synagogues were originally established just because it was hard to get to the temple. And so what you ended up with is this division between the idea of the word and worship as if the two could be separated at all. And what ended up happening within the Jewish culture is a rift that began to develop. And by the time Jesus shows up, 
you have people like Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, who are arguing and debating over kind of essential aspects of what Jews believe about life, the universe, and everything. What we see nowadays in the course of the last 500 years in Christianity is that exact same rift between the synagogue mentality, which was embraced by the Protestant uh, Reformation or revolt, depending on your point of view, and the temple-centric reality of the Catholic Church. And now, 500 years after that has begun, we're seeing within the Catholic Church a rift and division between those who want to emphasize the us aspect of it. The synagogue is very much an us mentality, as opposed to those who want to emphasize the God first mentality. And in the book of Revelation, we see that sort of thing being completely foreign. There's no sense whatsoever of an us thing at all. And so when we start looking at the actual history of our mass, we see the book of Revelation was written somewhere in the mid-90s A.D. We know that the first kind of information we have about what the very, very earliest masses look like appears in a document called the Didache. We also have St. Justin Martyr writing in the second century, talking about the way that people gathered and how the, the, the presbyters, uh, which was a, a kind of a new thing that was invented under the episcopoi, under the bishops, and they would be basically there, they were priests, and they were there to offer the mass. They would preach, and then they would break the bread, and they would send the deacons with portions of the bread, which were very, very carefully taken care of, to give to those uh, who were sick. And it was very, very much a, you receive this little bit of bread that we believe is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's in the 100s A.D. By the late 200s, we start to have fairly decent information that gives us some pictures that the early masses looked very much, very, very much like what the traditional Latin mass would look like today, where you had uh, ministers vested in clothes, with, uh, in special clothes and ceremonial garb, with incense, and that they were chanting memorized, specific, often Jewish chants, but some cases some very distinctly Christian chants, and there was a very ritualized and formalized way of it. In the 1960s, a lot of research was done which purported to show that most of the first 500 years of Christianity was very loosey-goosey. You know, that it was meeting in home churches and it looked more like prayer meetings than mass, and it was just kind of folks hanging out. It turns out that most of that research has been debunked as completely fatuous. It does not hold up. It turns out that the early home churches were actually totally renovated and looked a lot more like what we would think of as a monastery church now, uh, certainly more like that than it would look like uh, just a, a kind of a, a, a Baptist church. Uh, there was not a sense of chill about any of it. It was all very ritualized, very formalized, with the same Jewish cultural points, the same incense, the same notion of uh, the reception of the Holy Eucharist in a very, very ceremonial, in a very deeply ritual way. In fact, even the research and scholarship about receiving Holy Communion in the hand, it turns out is not accurate. Holy Communion was not received in the hand until the 1960s. It was not something that was done historically. And it turns out the book of Revelation, the more we pay attention to the liturgy aspects of it, the more we see that the exact same sort of thing was happening in the way that we develop the, the rituals of liturgy from the beginning. That's why we have the altar, the chair, and the ambo, uh, the, or, or the pulpit, if you'd prefer, because those are the images of the three kind of things that happen in the book of Revelation, the kingship associated with the throne, the sacrifice or priesthood associated with the altar, the prophetic vision or the prophetic uh, mission associated with the pulpit. And so it turns out that as we start to look even more closely at even details like the lampstand, at the specific hymnody that's chosen, at the specific music, at the ceremonial garb, architecturally, the book of Revelation is the prototype of the Catholic Mass. Now, what does that mean for you and me? Is the book of Revelation an image of heaven? Is it what heaven will be like? If we believe so, then it would seem that we have to start getting very serious about the question of whether or not our liturgy here actually re uh, reflects 
heavenly liturgy. And now this raises a different question, and it's something that I want to kind of use as my last sort of point before we have a little quick recap and we all go our merry way. What happens if I go to the pearly gates of heaven and I am truly, genuinely sorry for all my sins and I love the Lord and I want to be with Him and I want to know Him and I am sorry for my sins and Jesus looks at me and we get the thumbs up and we're going to heaven, all right, good. And so let's say I pass into purgatory or I go straight to heaven, however that plays out. And what happens if I get to heaven and I find out that it's so different than what I anticipated it would be, that it is not heaven for me. Now, I know this seems ridiculous, and this is not the way it really works. Don't fret. By the time you get out of purgatory, you would be completely and totally ready for an eternity with God in heaven. But I want you to imagine what would happen in that vein. What's the story? Because it is entirely possible that I'm living my life, you know, and I'm a, a good Christian, and I'm trying to do right. I pray a couple times a week. You know, I'm sorry for my sins, but Christianity is not the beating heart of my life. I make my way through life, you know, this, that, and the other. I like a good sports game. I like, you know, to go drink a beer in the backyard, have some, some, uh, some steak, you know, things like that. And, and what really brings me happiness in my life is stuff in my life. And then I go to heaven and I find out that I'm going to be spending eternity singing to God, looking at the Lord and being totally and completely tuned into Him and nothing else. Y'all, there's not a whole lot of people in this life who would think about that as heaven. And so we have this whole idea of, is heaven all of these ritual ideas of worship and, and chanting? And if it is, well, gosh, what happens if I don't want to go there? There really isn't any other option for me, is there? Now, as I say, purgatory is an incredible gift for us because purgatory will wash out of us the love of anything other than God. We will want to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And by nature, if I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, there is no room for college football. There is no room for all those other things that I think are satisfying, but are only satisfying because I am not fully devoting myself to the Lord. But still, this is one of these moments that causes us to go, hang on a minute. If the book of Revelation is painting a picture of heaven, it is a very, very worship heavy image of what heaven will be like. And if we take the book of Revelation and we pull out of it stuff about the end of the world, and we pull out of it messages of angels, we are really just left with worship. And so heaven then, at least in the mind of great saints like St. Thomas Aquinas, brilliant saint St. Augustine, heaven then becomes an eternal act of worship. Now, an act of worship that is so overwhelmingly joyful and fulfilling that we literally, Pope John Paul II said it, not me, we are literally like spending all of eternity in a state of eternal, perfect orgasm. That's what Pope St. John Paul II indicated. I mean, it, it boggles the mind because that's the closest thing we have in this life to the ecstasy and ecstatic experience of being totally and in every way overwhelmed with joy, heart, soul, mind, and strength. But, and that's what heaven would be like for all eternity, but it would be an eternal act of worship symbolized for us by things which are, you know, part of our liturgical experience, but at least in the United States, less so now than a couple years ago. And that should cause us to start asking some real questions. There's a lot of people discussing right now questions about ad orientum worship. Should the priest face the altar? Or should the priest face the congregation when he offers Mass? Well, for the last 50 years, we've faced the congregation, most priests have, but we have to stop and ask, well, has that worked? Has it been successful? Are the number of Catholics higher or lower now? Uh, are, are the Catholics who are coming to church more devoted? What percentage of those who call themselves Catholics are practicing the faith? And while we cannot say that the only thing that has changed in 60 years is whether the priest faces the congregation or faces the altar, it's one of these big question marks. It's also a big question mark when it comes to something like music. Music. 
because we can say, hey, the music of the Catholic Church in 1950 and in 1970 was totally opposite. Now we're singing folk music, uh, some of it played on the, the organ for no reason anyone can tell, and we have to stop and ask, does that make sense? I mean, the ideas at the Second Vatican Council about folk music were, or about modern music were very much that people would continue to write modern music. But what ended up happening is that there was a mountain of music written in the 1980s and then basically nothing in the last 40 years. And so we have all these kind of questions about the changes that we've made to the liturgy and changes that, that in a certain sense seem to bring us farther away from the text of the book of Revelation. And so those are question marks. I'm not here to answer them. I'm not here to even weigh in all that strongly on them. But what I really hope to get across, and I appreciate this has been a little confusing because you can't see this, but I had some significant typos on my paper where it wasn't laid out properly, and so I've had to, to hop a little bit in my brain to get this together. So I do apologize if I've been a little spacey in the middle of this talk where column two and column three were uh, flopped. But, but what I really want to try to get across here is to get into our heads and understanding that the book of Revelation ends up being a book about worship. It ends up being a book about heaven as an eternal act of worship. And when we start to see the Jewish elements that are imported, we can start to recognize and realize that the Catholic elements that we take out of it are genuinely what the Holy Spirit has to say about what worship should look like. This is one of the reasons that it's so difficult for our Protestant brothers and sisters to read the book of Revelation, because they have no sense of worship in terms of liturgy. They have no sense of ritual prayer, and in fact, they reject it. And so they're forced then to try to interpret these things without any real sense of the obviousness of what's trying to be said. And when we try to get into our head the idea that as long as I love the Lord, I'm good, we also miss the boat. So if we were to walk our way backwards now to the very, very first talk, we talked about how the scripture has to be read with a literal sense and a spiritual sense. We talked about how when we read the Bible, we want to pray and we want to ask the Lord, what does this say? And what does this mean to, to, to me? And maybe if we're an expert or if we're trying to teach other people, what does this mean to the church at large? But we should always humble ourselves and make sure that we're not trying to read a passage and apply that passage to the way that the world should be nowadays. After we finished looking at the basics of Bible study, we went into the, the messages of the angels to seven churches, seven churches around modern-day Turkey, all of which were under the authority of St. John, who had this vision of the book of Revelation right after he was attempted, right after the, the Roman emperor, uh, Decius, tried to boil him in oil outside the Lateran Gate. It did not go very well. John, the or John came up, John the beloved disciple, came back up to Patmos. He was still the bishop of these churches, and so he received this vision, clearly, which was meant to give him some direction, but these angels who were speaking to the churches, giving them warnings about being a fake Christian, warnings about not taking morality seriously, warnings about detaching themselves from, from the, the true authority of the church. Then we got into some pictures of heaven, looking not so much at the worship act of things, but what heaven looks like more broadly speaking. The idea of, of a city of gold that's also clear as glass and all the gemstones and pearl gates. We looked at images of heaven and of hell, and we talked a little bit about the end of the world. We tried not to get ourselves too distracted by, by uh, what could images mean, nor tried to look at them the way that we might try to look at some Nostradamus-like prophecy. Then after we finished looking at heaven, hell, and the end of the world, we stepped into worship, although in a somewhat distracted way. And we looked at the, at the reality that when we pull out of the book of Revelation, the introductory material, chapter 1, chapters 2 and 3, the messages of the angels, the dramatic images of the end of the world with our hornets and, and all those sorts of things and the days of darkness, when we pull that out, what we're left with is a book about worship. We're left with, with a, a set of images meant to give us a picture 
of transitioning from the Jewish way of thinking about worship to a predominantly Catholic Christian way of thinking about worship. And then, of course, that brings us right down to the, the reality that heaven itself then is an eternal act of worship. And that, of course, added one more detail onto the value of purgatory, where I might be a perfectly good person living a perfectly good Christian life who wants to know the Lord, wants to go to heaven, but does not want to spend eternity, you know, dressed in fancy clothes, worshiping and singing hymns and chanting. And, you know, purgatory then would provide us what we needed in terms of that perfect purification to make us ready to spend all of eternity in an act of worship, which is itself ecstatic. And so the book of Revelation is one of those that, that you know, obviously we've only scratched the surface. We've got 30 more talks if we want to really start getting into every detail about what the three days of darkness are and exactly how that will work and how do we tie that into Joel, uh, the book of Joel and, and, and all of his thoughts about the day of the Lord and what do we know also about apocalyptic literature in the book of Daniel and what can we say about other apocalyptic literature, especially Ezekiel and the Valley of the Dry Bones so, so much material. But I would strongly encourage you again to look to Dr. Scott Hahn, whose work on the book of Revelation, which I believe is called The Lamb's Supper, is absolutely remarkable. Um, just look into the, to the book if you're interested in some of the more minute detail. I took a good bit of what, I'm do, of what I'm, I've said from him, but still there's just so, so much material. And so look, this has been kind of a, a little bit of a, a confusing fourth section. I do apologize again for some, uh, some issues with my notes. I went over them, but I apparently did not go over them well enough. Uh, and so, uh, so I thank you very much. Now, the COVID catechism is uh, kind of coming to an end because we're, uh, we're kind of hopefully coming to an end of the COVID lockdowns. At least we are where I am. So what will happen is we will continue to have two talks a week, Tuesday and Thursday, throughout the month of May. Once we get to June... I'm going to back down to one talk a week, and we're going to rebrand as the CU Catacast. Um, Father Chris Decker is going to pick up one every week, so you should have two different talks uh, of very much catechism kind of talks like this, one from myself, one from Father Chris Decker, and so we should be able to make sure you're continuing to get access to good catechismal talks um, and, and uh, information uh, throughout the course of, well, for the foreseeable future, really. We want to kind of do something. We've been looking for a way to do this, and this is working out perfectly. And so, uh, so thank you for joining me. Thank you for, uh, for j joining me throughout the course of all these, uh, these COVID catechisms. Um, do please continue to reach out on social media if you have topics you're interested in. I have prepared another four-part Bible study on the book of the, on the, on the, writing, uh, on the prophet Elijah. Uh, who is found in First and Second Kings. And so that is coming sooner rather than later. That'll be another four-part series. I have some other shorter series that I'm working on uh, that are either two parts or just a single part, uh, and hopefully will be a little bit less than 55 minutes. But all the same, thank you for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. God bless you.